Good morning. I'm Terrell Sorensen, the Power County Extension Educator. I'm going to be doing your 2023 Water Outlook today. And I guess the title of my presentation today is It Could Change Weekly. First of all, I just want to start in and I guess one of the things I want to talk about is cheap water. It's one of the things that's kind of driven Idaho over the years. We have a cheap supply of water. And I guess um, what I'm saying is it's something that's going to be in the past for ag and maybe even for the urban areas too. Some of the 2023 water assessments this year, particularly around our area over there, are looking at 30 and 40 percent increases this year. It's going to be one of the highest increases that we've had in a long time. You look at the different uh, items that they're looking at this year, you got aquatic herbicides. Some of those areas, there's not a lot of them out there that they use, but the ones they have are taking some big jumps. Aquatic herbicides, a lot of cases now you're looking like for xylene, which is one they use quite a bit, is like 15.74 a gallon. You got uh, your, uh, your, Endothal products, Teton, Cascade, they're going to be up around 23 to 25,000 per tote this year. There's, there's a lot of variability going on in it, but one of the things too is your PVC pipe is going to take, has been taking a huge jump. You know, it follows the petroleum products. I think a few years ago you went from $1.50 to $1.70 for some pipe. Same pipe now is six, seven dollars a foot. Your concrete's gone up a lot. You know, things that the water industry uses a lot, your equipment costs, your excavators, machinery costs, you know, repairs on them has really jumped. Another thing that we want to talk a little bit about is the labor costs in the water industry now. It's uh, basically the labor costs have doubled in the last couple of years. And it's turned into what you call a revolving employees. You know, there's a lot of cost in training these employees. Over the years, it, it take a long time to train some of these employees. You know, most of them have CDLs. You got past pesticide applicator license. They operate heavy equipment. You know, they know construction. There's electricians. When you think about it, it's almost the perfect ideal that people have really wanted out in the you know, the building industries and you know what the labor market's been there. So there's been a real opportunity that these guys can move on. And a lot of your ditch riders and that used to start right out of high school. And that's where a lot of them would just retire right from those same positions. But that's really been changing lately. Another thing too, is you got the aging infrastructure that's really starting to pick up for the water industry. Uh, Idaho's 2022 legislature, they approved $325 million to go to the Idaho Water Resource Board. They're going to put about $250 million towards Anderson Ranch Dam raise. You got the Mountain Home Air Force Base, and then you got a lot of recharge projects they're trying to do on the Upper Snake. They put an additional $75 million and went to the Idaho Water Resource Board that's going to be that's coming out of the state surplus funds and they set aside 25 million that's going to go to irrigation companies canal companies irrigation districts there to for some of these aging infrastructures when you think about the cost of the new infrastructure now and especially on some of your water industry stuff you think about uh, some of the first deep wells for irrigation went in around 1946 and right now we're facing some of these wells now you're getting that are being 75 years old now and one of the things they didn't do is when they drilled these wells to start with they didn't put what they call cathodic protection on them and so you're getting a lot of rust coming into these well areas and some of these well casings they're having to replace I was talking to an individual lately here that just drilled a new well within the last year to replace one that was getting too old. And they said for a 16 hole inch hole, 
to drill and case it now is about $260 a foot. They had to drill at 700 feet, so they, he thought the new well was just costing them right out about $180,000, which is a lot of money for just, you know, 130, 160 acres. Also, at the same time, what's going on in the water industry is your domestic wells. You know, there's been a lot of building going on now, and just for a 200-foot hole with a 6-inch casing, you're looking at about $20,000 to set it up and get it going. A lot of cost involved in it. There's a lot of, uh, you know, variability because, you know, getting a good well at 200 feet is getting harder to do. Some of them are having to go seven, 800 feet. So there's a big cost in it. And any more water is becoming an important part, whether it's irrigation or building industry, it's getting expensive. So your water costs now on the urban scene, let's talk about that a little bit. You know, it's, uh, some towns and cities now are having huge increases in their water bills. And part of the trouble is, is, you know, we're, our infrastructure is just getting older. I know when you think about it now, we're coming up on the 100 year anniversary of the American Falls Dam. I live right in American Falls and really familiar with the history of it and that. And, they started moving the town when they did it in about 1924, 1925 is when they moved the town out. And that's coming up right now to the 100 years and they're having, to, they're having a lot of problems now with the water lines in there. Some of those are 100 years old, gotta be replaced. And they're looking now at a $38 million water project in the town. And what goes along with that now is you gotta put all meters on your new water projects. This uh, picture I got on this slide here is one of the original uh, dams and electrical uh, structures, hydro plants on the system. That's been replaced now. I just love this picture here. I had to put this one in. This is for my own benefit. This is in the old town site. This is in the reservoir now. It's under the water. Every building in here was moved out. This is in the winter. You can see where they're bringing the, the grain in from the dry lands around. And it was quite a good sized town when they moved it out. And you think some of those buildings that they moved out of there, they were huge buildings. It was quite a project they did. This is what it looks like now up there. This is, it was redone. The dam had some bad concrete in it. They had to redo it in 1977. And this is what the result of it is now with the new project that went in. But when you think about it now, we're just coming up right now on the 50th anniversary of it. I, for some reason, I always think it's still a new dam, but they've already had to go and replace a lot of the spillway gate concrete in it. They did that this last year spent several million dollars on that. You know, every time you get a major flood event, you're gonna have some problems, you gotta go back in and redo. A lot of costs with it. Another, just switching gears a little bit, kind of what's happening around us. There's a lot of stuff going on in the Southwest and South of Idaho. And this headline right here, why it's time for Utah to buy out alfalfa farmers. This was here a week ago, I was reading about this. I thought I'd just put this in because they're pretty close to ours. And what they're saying is that alfalfa farming uses 68% of the available water, but is just 0.2% of their economy. And they're really, the Great Salt Lake is drying up. And the industries on the Great Salt Lake, I don't know if you think about it much, but they're generating $1.8 billion the salt and the brine shrimp industries. And the Utah legislature, they're making moves away from the century old water policies of use it or lose it. They're trying to make it so if a farmer doesn't want to use his water, he can leave it in stream and get it into the salt lake. Another thing is they're anticipating some cash surpluses and they want to go out and start buying water rights from farmers upstream of the Great Salt Lake. And what you're talking about is going into the Bear River Basins, which Idaho is part of the Bear River Basin. 
They also want to set the price of water for farmers. They want to set what they consider it's really worth. In other words, they don't want any uh, subsidizing with it. So they're moving on and trying to increase the, the price on it. There's a lot going on with it. Another thing that's going on a lot right now is what they call virtual water, exporting virtual water. You hear a lot of stuff going on about it. Here's there's an example. There's a foreign company come in and bought 10,000 acres in Arizona. And the Arizona, that, that particular county, didn't have any control over their you know, groundwater pumping. So they bought that. It's a Saudi-based on DeMont, they bought 10,000 acres in 2014. What they do is they grow alfalfa on it to ship back to the Middle East for their dairy industry. And they have exclusive use to the water underneath that 10,000 acres. But now one of the congressmen down there is mad now and he wants to put a bill in, what they call the Domestic Water Protection Act. They're gonna impose a 300% excise tax you on the the product that's going out of the country. They want to do that on anything that's in the middle of a drought. So there's, but there's a lot more. California's got the same thing they're talking about, you know, exporting anything that uses a lot of water, especially alfalfa. So let's get back to Idaho now. So where are we for at water now? We came out of 21 with extremely low carryovers going into 22. Our snowpack, we had a great fall in 21. We got a lot of moisture. We looked really good till December, to January 8th. Then the spigot shut off and we basically got nothing clear into April 8th. Then our snowpack on April 1st was about 60 to 90, 69% of normal. We started off, you know, we had a warm March and we had extreme drought on the Henry's Fork and the Oneida County area. But in April, it, things started changing. We started getting a lot of moisture in parts of the state. April, May had record cold in many counties in the state of Idaho. Very cold, we were late getting the crops in and they're very wet and then it turned off and in July, August, September, October turned out very dry and hot. So we ended up October 31st, our carryover on the Upper Snake Reservoirs was about 120,000 acre feet shorter than we were the year before. And to kind of put it into perspective is uh, Island Park Reservoir holds about 130,000 acre feet. So you can see we're just about one reservoir short of water from where we were at the end of 21. So our reservoir storage right now is really poor coming into it. One of the things that kind of contributed to it too is at the same time, the Bureau did take out 54,000 acre feet of, of water, their powerhead water out of Palisade Reservoir. This was in the middle of flooding at the Lewiston area so it, we did lose that water. They were trying to, to fulfill the Nez Perce agreement at that time. So anyway, what we, just a quick update on this. Here you got March of 2022 in this graph here. It shows you pretty much the entire state was in a drought. We were having low precipitation. It was looking really bleak at the time. Then you come into May there all of a sudden we got some record precipitation in some areas. But you notice the southeast part of the Snake, Snake River and the southeast part of Idaho on that basin, the upper Snake Basin, basically did not get a lot of moisture, especially in some of the drought areas on the Portneuf River Basin were still lacking. I remember I went to camping up in uh, up on the Salmon River in the middle of June, I left American Falls and I didn't realize they were still in flood stage up there. The rivers were very high. You know, the fishing was terrible and we had streams that are already starting to dry up in Southeast Idaho. So there's a lot of difference between the parts of the state. 
I think I talked to some of the people in the Lewiston Orchards area. They said that the rivers up in that area were in flood stage for almost three months. So you see we had a lot of difference in the variability in the state and moisture. Here's where we ended up in October 22, just showing you a slide. After four months of drought, here we are back, kind of the same old picture. We had a very good uh, November. We got quite a bit of precipitation. We got the winter started off, but one thing we still do is we don't have a lot of moisture, soil moisture out there. Here's some of the guys that uh, play a big part in determining you know, what uh, irrigation season. You got the state hydrologist, the bureau rec, the water district. These are the guys that kind of you know, tell you what's going on. One of the things that they do too is the managers start meeting monthly, talking about the critical years, drought, flood years, snow surveys. This is what they did last year over in the Boise area. As you start here, you think you need to start giving irrigators some information on what they can expect. You know, starting around March 1st. Well, last year in the Boise area, March 1st was looking terrible at that time. So you had farmers starting to fallow some fields, you know, change their cropping patterns. Then two months later, they got, you know, plenty of water. So it's really a tough deal to do. You don't know what's going to go on, but somewhere around March 1st in the Boise area, you need to know what your water supply is going to be. And in the Upper Snake, you're talking about April 1st at the latest. To, they got to finalize their spring planting thing that's hard too, especially potato growers, they need to know what their water supply is. They're trying to sign contracts, you know, during the winter, knowing what they're going to put out there. And these are the different entities too. You got to remember every water entity is a little different, depending on what your supply is. You got small streams all the way up to big streams, mostly groundwater, you know, all natural flow, a little storage. These are different type of entities you have. You have a whole variety of entities that are using water. They all have one goal, is to try and determine what their supply is going to be for the upcoming year. Then each individual farmer has to go out and base their decision what their best guess estimate is. So you need the information. Some of the problems that the surface water people are facing right now it's becoming more and more difficult to determine what your water supply is. When you start getting into two or three years of drought, you're not sure you know, what your reach gain is going to be in each section of the river, you know, how the reservoir is going to fill. I know right now the American Falls Reservoir is filling pretty slow. Sometimes your reservoir fill is not living up to projections or expectations. And your reach gains, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but it's changing each year. So you're not sure how each, like American Falls, depends a lot on the reach gains or the spring flows, that you call it, to fill the reservoir. And that's part of what the Surface Water Coalition, the Groundwater IGWA agreement was in 2015, was to try to address some of those. I know there's been a lot of talk lately about the update on the settlement agreement. It was back in the, to the Department of Water Resources this last fall. The surface water people wanted to breach a contract that they weren't doing enough to fulfill their obligations. And the de director did determine that there was that problem. But we got the compliance, you know, the groundwater management plan now that they're looking at. And so this winter is going to be a critical time coming up for that. If you remember on some of the long-term practices in that agreement was the consumptive use volume reduction, your annual storage, water delivery, your irrigation season, you know, measurement requires. And the big one right there is your groundwater level goals and benchmarks. Another thing I want to talk about a little bit right here is the, your consumptive use volume reduction. What they agreed to in this agreement was the groundwater will be 
Diversions will be reduced by 248,000 acre feet annually. And they can't rely on the common rental pool for that. You also got consumptive use. That's the water consumed by crops, transpiration or evaporation, then your non-consumptive use. And one thing I like to stress is your consumptive use reduction and your water conservation are not the same thing. They are two different things when you think about it. You know, I always... <clears throat> there, also, there's a variety of ways consumptive use is being implemented. You got the land following, the CREP program they got out there, the voluntarily doing it. You know, the CREP program started out fairly strong, but it's kind of fallen off in the last few years. It's one program that could be used a lot more. In gun reductions or removal, you know, you got crop rotations, you're changing crops with lower use of water. Cover crops, this kind of figuring in now, if you're starting to use cover crops or watering in your chemicals, you're, they all need water to do it. Then we get into the annual water delivery irrigation season reduction. These are some things that they went over. Here's your, we got this done pretty well. Everybody need to put meters on deep wells. We got that accomplished in 2018. So we're getting some pretty good data out there now. Here's our graphs right now that we, you know, we rely a lot on. This shows that if we reduced you know, our groundwater used 240,000 acre feet. If we did 250,000 acre feet of recharge, this is where the, this is the graph that tells us where we're gonna end up if we follow this. It shows this, this is when we started in 2015. Right now, this is the latest one that came out. They measure it every spring this time, March, April. You can see here in 2022, we were doing really well from 2016, and we had a lot of recharge going on. You can see in 2020, we came up, but now the last two years, you've seen we dropped back down. We're down to a minus 7.62, and we should be at about a minus 3.9 right now. So we've got a, you know, a big reduction on that area. Here's another one that graph that's showing you know, what our target areas, you know, where we should be. And it looks like this year we're going to end up, you know, for 20, when they take them in 2023, we're going to be just about 10 foot, a minus 10 foot from the well index. So you look over there and it said we should be about four. So you see we got a lot of, a lot of ground to make up on that. It's going to be an interesting winter to decide what they're going to do, you know, to, follow up with this, see what we can do. Here's another little one that shows the different wells. There's basically about 20 wells out there. I think there's 19. Each one of these wells has been doing a little bit. You can see in the last two years with the drought how both of them, you know, all of the wells now are really starting to take a downturn. Here's another one too that I just wanted to show you. This is your reach gains for a critical area between Blackfoot and Neely. That's right around the American Falls area. This is your fill on the American Falls Reservoir. And you can see back in the mid 80s, we were almost up to 2.1 million acre feet on the reach gains. And right now we're probably down around 1.3 million. So we've lost a lot of, this is the refill during the winter to help fill the reservoir. This is just a picture I put in and just showing, you know, the different areas, the problems we got in there. Kind of for your information, you can see we got a lot of problem areas with our groundwater. You know, some of the lower areas right there. And just to finish up a little bit, you know, I, there's been a lot of talk, you know, on the removal of the dams. and. One thing I just wanted to just throw in real quick was the Biden administration did come out saying they want dam removal. I won't go into that much right now. I think there's a lot of information out there. A lot of people are talking about it. 
This is a slide I just wanted to end up on. This is kind of a, you're looking back there, you had some really good water years back in 97, 1997, and you can see this is kind of what's been looking like the last couple of years. You know, we got very little going over it right now. There's not, uh, you know, we don't have the ability right now to do much recharge with it, but I guess like I said to start with, stay tuned, it could change weekly. We're looking, you know, somewhat good right now on the snowpack. We just don't want it to shut off this year. So this, uh, we don't want, you know, to end up where we are on the right again. Would It'd be good to have a year like 1997 again. Okay, thank you.